Kitchen was a startup before that term became in vogue. They were young Jewish people who were interested in creating this alternative lifestyle coming out of that hippie dumb in the late 60s and early 70s. It was unusual for a progressive or radical or activist group to be working in the Jewish community. What motivated me was the large forces that were going on around me. The politics of unions, and the politics of food. There wasn't something that allowed Jews, young Jews, to live together, to work together, to try to make an impact on the Jewish community. It was a vision-driven idea where people were so committed to this notion of an anti-profit collective where people came together and served the Jewish community. At the time, the people in the 60s, people my age, were demonstrating all the time. This was a step towards revolutionary change. You organize around unmet needs of a community. And there was no kosher restaurant in Washington. I said, great, we could do it around kosher food, around values that are important. People were devoted to this cause that was really bigger than just running a restaurant. It wasn't only about food. You know, it was about raising consciousness. It was another job representing my values, and so this was a place I could go and feel very comfortable. It was a sort of gregarious, open, friendly place, so we enjoyed it. We were very naive in a way, but we took it all really seriously. We were very passionate about it. It had its challenges, like all startup organizations, but I think it left a lasting impact on the landscape of the Washington Jewish community. After university, I decided that I wanted to see the world. And uh, I spoke to a girlfriend at the time and another good friend, Bill Dolnick. And so the three of us flew to England. We hitchhiked all over Western Europe, Northern Europe. We took a train to uh, Moscow, Warsaw, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey. And when we were in Romania, we got to the town of Cluj. Cluj is a fairly sizable town. And I went to the Jewish community and they said, okay, great, we'll find a place for you to sleep and come with us to dinner. And they took us to a small kosher restaurant. And in the restaurant, there were old people, young people, students, and they made us feel like we were in a community. They hugged us, they shook our hands, they looked, they talked to us, they were excited that we were there. It was a great feeling. And in the middle of it, I realized what I wanted to do when I, when I grow up, what I wanted to do when I get back to America. And that was to start a restaurant that had the same feeling of community. But I want to do it on values that I feel connected to. It was sort of a common vision of building a structure for organizing in the Jewish community around values and around politics and centrally around food, because food is what brings people together. At that time, it was a real need for the community. It was eight years without a kosher restaurant. So we created a place, a nonprofit restaurant with good food that cost very little and creating a nonprofit restaurant, I mean, it's the perfect organizing hub. People who always want food, finding interesting ways to present it at an angle, it will always draw people to you. And uh, yeah, maybe we were onto something by using food to organize for a cause or social change or justice. We had a pretty good idea. It was part of a political movement around food and about educating people around basically socialism and using food as the, the tool to do it. And I think 
we really got the message across at the kosher kitchen because it was warm it was friendly but we had the mission and the mission was really important to us always there's this notion that we develop community around a table when we sit around a table and eat we share ideas and we develop bonds that we don't normally build food is a way to break down barriers and and open up doors and that was one of the purposes of the restaurant was to improve communication and food did it and and the fact that it was kosher allowed the broadest range of people to come into the restaurant they would never have been in the same room with them if there wasn't the lure of the food right and a great bowl of chicken soup with matzo balls it was great food except for the flunkin they loved the flunkin i don't get that <laughs> I think one of the things I really liked was bringing the community in. I mean, people, I'm sure people ate at the kitchen who are middle class, upper class, Republicans, Democrats, independents, and they all got to experience in an immediate way what these values were. So it wasn't just a bunch of liberal young leftists talking to ourselves. We spent about a month or two looking for a location. And it wasn't very easy because we didn't have a lot of money. We couldn't pay a lot of rent. Uh, we had no expectation. We had no idea how much money would be coming in. So we found a coffee shop, the El Dorado Towers in, in White Oak. And it was very small. It was very cramped. Oh, it was in a dark basement. It was definitely a little let down when you walked into the place. It was so informal that it was funny in many cases. Sometimes if there was no room, you'd sit next to someone else so you didn't even know because your table was taken, but that's okay. You just got to know the person next to you when you sat and talked. So it was almost like a family. We were looking for places in Washington where we would be able to go for a meal outside. And since we would not eat in a non-kosher facility, the fact that the kosher kitchen had opened was a reason for us to go there and maybe go with other friends as well. It was a terrific location. New York kosher restaurants were much more formal than the kosher kitchen. The nice thing about the kosher kitchen was it was just much more comfortable and much more friendly. It was wonderful. It was warm and it was fun. It was just a really good feeling, almost like inviting someone into your home. My friends loved it, I loved it, my family loved it. It was special. I guess set the framework. I, I said collective, not-for-profit, community-based, worker self-management, kosher. If you could agree to that, then great, welcome. In the beginning, I had recruited many of my friends. I was actually kind of recruited to come by Ira, one of, one of the founders who was you know, a close friend and who, with whom I had traveled. We wanted to provide social services and we needed a certain amount of legitimacy to get support from the institutions of the Jewish community of Washington. I had a social work degree. I was interested in community organization. That's what I had been doing both in social work school and before. So Ira was, was reeling me in with that and the other bait. He says, I really want to fix you up with Rachel, who's his co-founder. I was attracted to living collectively from my second year of college. I left the dorms. I went and lived in a house that was doing political work. And then I went and lived on kibbutz, which was a commune. And the kitchen was another communal environment which reflected my politics. I heard about it, went, had dinner, and fell in love immediately, and immediately raised my hand and said, this is something I want to be a part of. 
The attraction was multifold. It was people working together. It was working for ideals that I held. It was the Jewish environment uh, that wasn't particularly religiously oriented, but more culturally oriented. I grew up in a family that was socialist, uh, Yiddishist, and I just loved perpetuating that in some way. You could say we exploited ourselves, we overworked ourselves, underpaid ourselves, which caused you often to be tired, wrung out. I was like physically tired at the end of the day because I had been involved mentally and physically, and I like being that kind of passionate and involved in work. We're not sure when we slept. Uh, because I was a full-time student in a fairly rigorous science curriculum, and then I was working in the, in the kitchen. And we weren't just working in the kitchen. We built the tables. Right. We shopped. Yeah. Everyone did everything. Everyone did what they could do based on their skill set. Everybody's contribution was not only honored, but critical. We couldn't have weak links because Everybody had their role. We used to wash dishes across the hall from the dining area. And there was, it wasn't any sense of like that that's like a more degraded thing to do or where you worked your way up to be a busboy and then worked your way up to be a waiter. There was virtually no hierarchy. Uh, and it really came out of a group. Once a week we'd have meetings and we would discuss all these issues. You know, what could we do? How, what, what's on the menu? What should we change? And it would be easy for one person to make decisions. And okay. But this is it, this is what we're going to do. And we wanted everything to be on the basis of a consensus. That means people talked, and they talked, and they talked. And we went around the table again and again until we could have an agreement. So it was not the most efficient way of using our time, but it was a way that people felt they were heard, they had a chance, complete input on every issue, on anything. But it, a lot of people, it was difficult, and it was a little bit difficult for me. We decided to embark on criticism, self-criticism. At the end of the, the day, we ate right. the yeah. unedible leftovers <laughs> that we couldn't serve the next day. Which was called the people's food. People's food, <laughs> right. We right. would go around the room, and almost everyone started with themselves. Yeah. It was really important yeah. for people to be able to not just admit that they failed, but to, to sort of proclaim that they didn't do something right. And that is so against you know, bureaucratic, hierarchical workplaces, it was really amazing. And it was, to my mind, I mean, not to everybody's mind, it was the best work environment that I've ever been in. To this day, I can say that. I like the uh, criticism, self-criticism sessions that we had at the end of the day. I mean, we used to make fun of ourselves and make fun of the sessions, and we thought it was kind of funny, you know, a bunch of Jewish kids, mostly Jewish youngsters, sitting around a table in White Oak, Maryland, having this, you know, Maoist practice, but it was a really serious way of trying to consider the work you did, consider the impact you had in other people, and they were, often they were very hard, you know. You know now I'm a rabbi, but even back then I, you know, had a pretty good Jewish education. The book of Leviticus says we should surely rebuke our neighbor. Maimonides said that this was the most, the hardest of the 613 mitzvot commandments to fulfill, because to rebuke somebody you care about lovingly and tenderly, very hard. It was very intense because, uh, first of all, I was young and it was my way or the highway. And I remember at meetings some very, very intense arguments. There was one over whether the men should keep their head covered to make sure everyone in the community was comfortable. I was a secularist. I found that to be oppressive and who had the right to tell me to keep my head covered? And so that was difficult. We always had some conflicts over how, how commercial we were going to be and what products we would use, whether they were products of just or unjust labor, et cetera, et cetera. But the distributor had Coke in the soda machine. So Coca-Cola at the time, it was a, a sense of this being this global corporation with tentacles that are all over the world and imperialistic tendencies and blah, blah, blah. So we can't serve Coke. It's a symbol of the decadent imperialist economy. And to me, the Coke controversy symbolizes more of um, that we can laugh at ourselves, that you can carry some things too far. 
We work together and we live together, good or bad, and we argue together. So our criticism, self-criticism sessions really were actually, I think, a growing period for everybody. I mean, we argued about sugar and honey. Having those stupid arguments led us to be able to look in and see what's important in life. We began the planning for the Kosher Kitchen knowing that we were going into business, but it wasn't for our own pockets. It wasn't for our own advancement. It was a community service. We had no money of our own, so we needed the support of the community. So we started out making it clear that this would be a nonprofit restaurant. We raised money from synagogues, from individuals, from organizations. The Jewish Week is the Washington Jewish newspaper. They allowed us to put a half page description of what we're doing and everything else, and they did an editorial for free that said, this is a great project, these are young people that we should support. You should contribute money so we could have a kosher restaurant in the Washington area. From my perspective, it was a way to say to the community, we're going to create a kosher restaurant, we're going to provide these services, we're going to provide social services and kosher food, and we can do it without having that profit motive. For us, it was challenging this notion that we should be making money on certain things, and food was not something we should be making profit on. You know, food for people, not for profit. Smithsonian Festival of American Folklife wanted culturally appropriate food. And when they were talking to the Marriott about providing kosher meals for the participants, they said, be advised it will triple the price of the food. And they ended up with us <laughs> because we were a lot less expensive. But that gives you an idea of, oh, well, if you want kosher, three times as much. And we're saying, no, it doesn't have to cost three times as much. You can feed people for a reasonable price. And the idea that we could provide an opportunity for the poorest members of society to come out and enjoy something that normally only privileged people do was really important to me too. And so we'd get these you know, wealthier people coming in and saying, you're not charging enough money. And we'd say, leave a bigger tip. <laughs> As we evolved our own experience and our own principles around the work we were doing and absorbed other influences. There was a co-op movement in Washington that was quite political, expressly leftist, and we started saying that we were anti-profit. And in some ways, it became a really important conversation. It was a way of talking about our philosophies, our values, our ideals, the way we wanted to live out certain principles. It was partly intended to provoke people. And that was a little bit of the spirit of the 60s coming through, I think. The logical extension of what anti-profit is would be socialism. We chose anti-profit maybe because in America, socialism had such a negative connotation that we were afraid to use it. We are really against the whole idea of the capitalist system. I, I believe in cooperation over competition. I don't consider myself a capitalist. I am still a democratic socialist. I don't believe that an economic system should serve the people who have the capital. I think that the needs of the community should be paramount. The summer of 1976, there was a lot going on. There was uh, the, the bicentennial. The GSA, I think, was giving out spots on the parade route, and we had an ice cream truck. We were selling ice cream bars for a quarter, and we made over $1,200 with that ice cream truck for the kosher kitchen. And we also catered the people's bicentennial. We made hundreds and hundreds of sandwiches and sold them for that. It was important to have a kitchen that was a nonprofit or an anti-profit, but a kitchen that also served the community. It wasn't only about food. It was about raising consciousness. It was about bringing a more meaningful Judaism into people's lives. It was about connecting people in the Jewish community, whether secular or reform and orthodox. 
we wanted to be a place where everyone could come and find some commonality and be nurtured Jewishly in a positive way, which didn't exist very well up to that point. The Jewish community was so... Fragmented. Fragmented is a perfect word. Fragmented. People didn't know each other. And, and as I'm reflecting on the kitchen now, there's no other place that was, I think, as respected, you know, as a safe place for Jews of all persuasions yeah. to come and together. And I think we created a framework for that. Also, the community table, I think the yeah. community table was a real important innovation, that we had a table right. where anybody who sat at this table would be willing to speak to anybody Somebody. else. And we had Orthodox, conservative, reform, it's secular it's people yeah. who weren't Jewish, all kinds of people it's sitting it's at this it's table it's and it's talking, it's and, and it would be amazing. Sometimes yeah, they would talk the whole good. evening. Yeah. And they felt, and also we, when we were, you know, waiters or whatever, we would often <laughs> sit down yeah. with the people at the table and start talking to them <laughs> as well. You know, the restaurant was like a restaurant. We made food, served food, people gave us money, great. But we also created an experience. Yeah. It's not just a restaurant, it was something. It a, was a, a culture, a culture yeah. that we, we that people I think had memories of what they did besides right. just you know I had flunking to them. This notion of bringing all parts of the Jewish community together instead of you know the different groups, Lubavitch Jews and with secular Jews, we used to have these incredible conversations because we did have some Lubavitch Jews who were part of the collective. And it was a time when we were really trying to work on feminism and how could Orthodox Jewish women accept all of these binding rules and, the, and they would give us their perspective. And it was eye-opening for me to understand how they felt being Orthodox was liberating. And so we would have these conversations around a table with food. And so that was just from our own experience, but we were hoping to accomplish that with the whole community. In the 60s and 70s, a lot of mostly younger Jews who yearned for community and spirituality were coming together in new ways. They didn't feel comfortable or welcomed or satisfied with existing religious structures. My parents were Holocaust survivors and so my upbringing was a little fragmented uh, coming to America on a boat from England when I was two. So I didn't really feel connected with the Jewish community. It was hard for me to make those connections, but at the Kosher Kitchen, I seriously feel like it was the most Jewish experience I had had up to that point. For me, it was um, extremely important that, as a Jew, I acted in such a way that mirrored the teachings of the prophets and of the deep teachings about justice in the Torah, and to take it forward, to impact the community by meeting in their needs and also to uh, present our way of looking at the world and, uh, and, and restoring Jewish values you know, to a community that we felt was uh, becoming distant from its core teachings. When I first came to the collective, it was in the fall right before the holidays, we knew that there were a lot of younger Jews that were not affiliated with synagogues, felt drawn to the holidays, wanted a way to celebrate them, but didn't, didn't feel comfortable, weren't gonna go to a synagogue, and let's just provide an alternative space. So we drew a group of primarily younger people who this was the space for them to have a meaningful experience of the, the Jewish High Holidays. So we had the full backing of the Orthodox establishment. We had the full backing of the conservative establishment until we started having services on Rosh Hashanah for our uh, community of young Jews who uh, wouldn't step foot in a synagogue or a temple. They didn't really understand that we were much more than food. We were shocked one day when we got a letter from the conservative movement that said, now wait a second, what you're doing is not in the precincts of being a kosher restaurant. You're trying to do something that really belongs to a synagogue. And we were shocked that they saw us as competition to synagogues. These were people who had never ever joined a synagogue. It wasn't for people who were already going to synagogues. It was not a threat to them, but they saw it as a threat. 
or as a potential threat. And the letter said, you know, we supported you in the beginning, and they did. They were great. The conservative movement was wonderful. But now, if you continue to do this, we're going to have to tell everyone that we, don't, we no longer support this restaurant. We, we just couldn't believe it. So we wrote, we wrote a reply, a fairly serious reply, that, of course, we take everything seriously, and we, we spent uh, days debating each sentence. It was, that's how we worked. Very few people have a business where they know in advance that they're going to alienate more, maybe 90% of the people who could be customers from the beginning and on purpose. On purpose. We had two strikes against us. Um, the, the Jews were suspicious of us because we were leftists, and the left was suspicious of us because we insisted on asserting our Jewish identity. And navigating those shoals was often difficult. We had speakers about uh, somewhat controversial topics, issues that weren't always talked about in the same way in the official Jewish community. And we were trying to raise people's consciousness. Jewish funeral practices, Jewish feminism, uh, Israel, uh, our support for United Farm Workers. At the time, there was a, a boycott of non-union lettuce and grapes. The United Farm Workers, mostly Mexican-Americans, were the, working in fields all over the country and getting really low wages. And the working conditions were terrible. They were trying to organize. Not every state would recognize their union, and it was a really big struggle. And uh, they called a boycott. And the rabbis in Washington and in Boston and maybe a few other places said that non-union lettuce and grapes are, is the product of oppressed labor, and that's it's not kosher, you can't eat this. In the Bible, there are a lot of laws about what is kosher, what is non-kosher, what animals you could eat, what you can't eat, uh, mixing milk and meat together. This was also part of the Bible that tells us how we relate to labor, how we relate to what's fair and what's not fair, what's equal measurements, what should be done by a moral person. And the rabbis interpreted that non-union lettuce and grapes fell into the category of ex exploitation of something that's not fair. And that is, according to Jewish law, it's against the law. And we took it seriously. It had to do with that verse in Leviticus that you should not right. eat food from yeah. the hands of oppressed yeah. labor. Right. Right. So right. for us, it so was we tied it into cash. Heaven. We had the There's blood right. on those grapes right. Right. poster. Right. 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 And right. I can remember, I got into a long argument with a customer over whether that poster was unappetizing right. and therefore shouldn't be no. in a restaurant. I and remember an old we felt it was really important. Not just important, it was our essence that we were there, not just to be a nice place to eat, but we were there to, to try to educate the people in the community to say, this is an issue. My sense of impactfulness on the Jewish community also included the revitalization of Jewish life through the arts, and not only through the restoration to prophetic values. Uh, when we started the Fabrengen Jewish Counterculture Center in downtown D.C. The arts were an important part of that, and that's because we felt that to fully and, and, and in a healthy way um, be Jewish was to also involve the, the arts, and we're talking about music, movement, dance, literary arts. We created a Jewish folk arts society and began dreaming about using the arts to revitalize and revive Jewish life, you know, in the Washington, D.C. area for all Jews, no matter what their denominations or persuasions. Through the arts, we could come together again to express ourselves more fully and uh, naturally and in a more healthy way. So the Kosher Kitchen was a center that took on also this, this way of seeing the revitalization of Jewish life. We encouraged the arts. That was another way the Kosher Kitchen left an imprint, and there was an explosion happening of, of Jewish folk arts, textiles, pottery, painting, and we displayed art in the restaurant, creating alternative uh, opportunities for learning about culture and, and, and literature. One night a week was dedicated for folk dancing. Saturday night, we'd always have music. There were musicians lined up to play there, and they would play for free. 
because it was the sense of community, the sense of being part of something. One time I was playing there, there was a guy washing pots and pans in the kitchen, and it was David Schneer. Now, uh, David Schneer, of course, uh, sings and plays guitar, and he had this little group called the Forbringant Fiddlers. Uh, one Saturday night, David and I got together at the kosher kitchen. He brought his guitar, I brought my bass. It sounded great. We needed a bass player, and there he was, and we also incorporated his sitar playing. We started the whole idea of Jewish raga because of Theo's influence, and he's been an essential part of um, the emerging Jewish folk arts community in the Washington area ever since that. Now, that was uh, 41 years ago, and I've never left the group, so I guess that worked out. And at one point in 1977, the Fabringen community and the Kosher Kitchen and the Jewish Folk Art Society came together to create the first Jewish Folk Arts Festival in 1977. Because we had, again, a common vision or the common desire to revitalize the Jewish community also through the arts. We tried to have something different than what most people would experience in a restaurant. I was very attracted to the senior population that lived in the building. Between lunch and dinner, they'd come and share their recipes. We offered them free uh, desserts and tea all afternoon. It really became a community center. Someone said, ah, the Jewish Social Services Agency could probably use you to do Meals on Wheels to elderly people who can't cook for themselves, who can't get out of the house. I started the Meals on Wheels program and Senior Citizen Drop-In Center, and we did that through cooperation with a Jewish Federation agency, Jewish Social Service Agency, a woman who was in charge of those programs, was a social worker. I think she understood what we were trying to do. She, in some sense, ran interference with us with the higher level. So there were some allies, well, several conservative rabbis, and, but even a few Orthodox rabbis said, they're okay, Let them, maybe they look a little weird, they look different, uh, but they could get what we were doing, having a bigger vision of Jewish community and being a place where, where it could you know, flourish. People wanted to move on. And I eventually said, okay, I, I've done a lot with middle-class Jews. I'm ready now for something a little bit different. And uh, it was hard for me to see it closed. It was very sad, you know, to see it go. I don't think there has been, certainly since the Kosher Kitchen left, another restaurant like it. Do I ever think there will be? No, because I think unless you really have a group of people committed to the community, rather than simply doing it as a business, you wouldn't have anything that would match the style and the ambiance and the fervor of the Kosher Kitchen. I definitely think it was a success. Um, it planted seeds not only in us, but in our customers. I think it was a statement that your ideals can be lived, you can make a difference. For what it was in its time, it was a successful experiment in both community and community organization alternative ways of providing social services. I mean, the kitchen closed after it, you know, it stopped doing collective management. It was moving more towards a more traditional business model. And that's when it closed, not when it ran, uh, you know, cooperatively, uh, collectively. The experience that the community had from seeing a group of young, passionate, activist kids committing to their own community committing to serving their community and opening up conversation, ideas, discourse and struggle, and sometimes political struggle, was very important. And I keep hearing people who tell me it, it really changed their lives to have that happen. It certainly changed our lives. We were driven by ideals to create this restaurant. And it was to try and encapsulate values that we felt were really important. 
And it turns out that most of us, to some degree, still live those values. We have two rabbis, we have four community social workers, many people who work for nonprofit organizations. We have three people, including Rachel and David, who created nonprofit organizations that still exist today, that still do great things, both in the local community, the national level, and even in the international level. And some of our adult children also are involved in trying to make the world a better place. Even though it only lasted a few years, its repercussions have lasted in my life. And I just hope that other people will be inspired by this small microcosm, this very small example of what people can do, how they can make a difference in people's lives and in the lives of a, a community. You don't have to be young to do things. You know, you can be any age. You can change the world in your own way. It is absolutely realistic to live by your ideals. Your values and ideals are the engine that drives you forward. I think our activism translates to other generations. And the activism I see today, the powerful urge to make a better world is very similar to what we did. What we see today in the 21st century is an outgrowth of new activism, new commitment to anti-racist ideals, sometimes interfaith ideals, to working for change, working for a more equitable and just world. I think you see that all through history. It's in many ways the best part of being human. And when that can be experienced in a community, it's never a failure. It always creates ripples of change. You got nothing to lose but your chains, 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 but your chains. All together now. The workers of the world unite. You got nothing to lose but your chains. The workers of the world unite. You got nothing to lose but your chains. 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 But So we're going to dance you out a little tune, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah.